All right, so uh, last time we started to uh, learn about uh, homotopy and uh, more precisely how the relation of homotopy in a model category. And so because uh, we have this duality between uh, vibrant and cofibrant objects, the uh, vibrations and cofibrations, we have uh, two kinds of uh, homotopies. So we have uh, left homotopies and right homotopies. And the left or right is about uh, which side of the home you are on. So left homotopies are more about what goes on in the source of the morphisms, whereas uh, right homotopies are more about what's going on in the target of the morphisms. Right, so uh, let me briefly remind you that uh, for left homotopies, we are dealing with uh, cylinders. So uh, diagrams like this, where you factor uh, the co-diagonal by uh, co-fibration followed by a weak equivalence. Uh, and we saw, and so a homotopy is a map defined on the cylinder, which, uh, which is a factorization of a map FG from the co-product to X. And we had a few properties, mainly the compatibility of uh, the homotopy relation with the composition. Um, the fact that it's an equivalence relation if the source is cofibrant. And also we had this uh, interesting lemma about the post composition being a bijection if uh, the map was a, either uh, an acyclic vibration or a vibration, uh, sorry, a weak equivalence between vibrant objects using this uh, brown lemma. And of course we have a dual picture about right homotopies. Uh, <clears throat> So you just dualize everything. So right homotopy is just left homotopy, but in the opposite category. So are there any questions about uh, all this before we actually uh, start the, the next uh, step? No, no questions, all right. So the goal for today is to use this uh, homotopy relation to have uh, an explicit re description of the homotopy category. We call have an explicit description. Description of the homotopy category of C using the homotopy relation, all right? So let me start with a proposition. So, so far, as we saw, we have these uh, two notions, left and right homotopies, and they appear to be uh, unrelated. Uh, well, in, in, if you have uh, good enough objects, these uh, two notions are actually equivalent. So let uh, F and G from A to X be two morphisms. Uh, if A is cofibrant, then uh, the left homotopy relation implies the right homotopy relation. And I am sure you can guess that if X is fibrant, then the right homotopy relation implies the left one. All right. So as usual, uh, the left relation behaves better if the source is cofibrant, and the right relation behaves better if the target is fibrant. All right. So before writing down the proof, let me just write down the corollary that uh, if uh, A and X are respectively cofibrant and fibrant, then the left homotopy relation and the right homotopy relation define the same relation on on C of A X uh, denoted just by uh, this symbol, and it would just be called the homotopy, not left or right homotopy, because it's the same thing. All right, so the proof of this proposition 
is as follows. So I will just uh, prove the first one. The, of course, the second one is uh, completely dual. There is uh, nothing uh, hidden here. So let us assume that A is covariant and that we have a cylinder like this, I zero, I one, and a homotopy H like this. All right. So we have a two left homotopic map from A to X and A is covariant. So what we want to do is to find a right homotopy between the two. So we are looking for, well, first of all, a path object. And a homotopy like this. Uh, oh, sorry. It goes here. So we are looking for some k like this. Uh, and as we are going to see, we can take uh, any path object here. It doesn't matter. Basically, what we want to do is uh, to see that uh, if A is covariant and F and G are left homotopic, then they can factor through any uh, path objects of uh, X. Well, uh, P is some path object of X. And as we saw, we can uh, just find any by factoring the diagonal of X. All right, so we want to be able to define some map from A to P, which has this uh, prescribed behavior when you go into X. And there is there are two ways of going uh, into X and having this, uh, uh, sorry, and having this uh, kind of map. So either what we can do is apply, so we are going just to emphasize some, some of the two, so F here. So we can go to F and let's call this map pi and go into P and if we apply the diagonal here, oh, sorry, it's just a vibration. And we go into X cross X, this map, what is it? It's simply F and F, all right? Or the second way to do it is to go through our cylinder. And we saw from uh, an over lemma that uh, I zero is an acyclic cofibration because A is cofibrant. We saw this uh, on Monday. And we go here in two different ways into X. Either we use FJ where J is uh, which map is this map or we, we use H and it's the same thing here. Here, this factorization tells us that J circle I zero is the identity. So if we uh, post compose with F, then we get just F. And by definition of a homotopy, if we take H and we compose it with I zero, we also get F. So this diagram commutes, all right? Both compositions are equal to F, F. This map is an acyclic vibration. This map is a vibration. So there exists some lift here, which is, uh, which is not K, let's call it uh, L. So there exists some lift here from C to the path object. All right, then L circle I1 is a left homotopy from F to G, All right? So as you see, we use the first inclusion here and we compose it, we compose this leaf with a second inclusion. So why is uh, this a left homotopy from F to G? So first of all, it, it has the right uh, kind of, uh, uh, how to say, uh, source and target. So the source is A, so from A1 goes into C and then L goes into P. So it goes into the path object. 
And if we compute P1 circle K, this is P1 circle L circle I1, but P1, so P1, P2. So P1 circle L is FJ. And as we saw, J circle I1 is by definition the identity, so this is F. Whereas on the other hand, P2 circle K is P2 circle L circle I1 is H circle I1. And by definition of the fact that uh, H is a left homotopy, this is G, all right? So we have this proof. And of course, the proof of the second statement is uh, completely dual. OK, so is this uh, good for everyone, this proof? It's simply like some kind of, uh, you have to work a little, see why, where the lifting property has to come in. And basically, it has to come in here. You have to find a map from A to P, which factors this map. So to get this map, F is either at the same time F circle J circle I0 or H circle I0, and G is H circle I1. Or if you want to go the other way, it's F circle J circle I1. Sorry, G circle J circle I1. So you use these two things and you get this uh, lifting uh, problem. All right, is this okay? Yeah, so this is a bit of a technical lemma, but now we can start uh, going into the description of the localization because now we just have one relation and not two different ones that could maybe be unrelated. In general, these two relations are not the same. It's only when the source is cofibrant and the target is fibrant that they agree. And in this case, uh, definition, If uh, A is uh, cofibrant and X is fibrant, you get bracket AX. So just like in the topological category, uh, it should be homotopy classes of maps. This is simply the home, the home set in C between A and X, modded out by the relation, which is either the left or the right homotopy relation. And we are going to prove that in the homotopy category, in the localization, the home set between a cofibrant and fibrant object is given by this kind of thing. So instead of looking at uh, zigzags where uh, wrong way maps, so if you remember in the localization, you had to look at things like this, which is very complicated. Uh, you don't know how long the zigzag is going to be and so on. If you have good enough objects, then you just need to look at maps from the two objects and mod out by some relation, which is exactly what we do in topological spaces or chain complexes. We look at maps and we mod out by the homotopy relation. But this only makes sense if the, the source is cofibrant and the target is fibrant. All right. Uh, OK. And uh, from this, we define a new category. is denoted by this is notation pi ccf so the objects of pi ccf are the objects of ccf are the cofibrant vibrant objects and the morphisms in pi ccf between a and x are simply this bracket. And so there is a, a little, uh, how to say, a little thing hidden in the definition. Maybe it should be a proposition. So check that this defines a category using So if you have two homotopy classes of maps and you want to compose them in pi CCF, 
then you just take two representatives, G and F, you compose them and you take their class. You have to check that this doesn't depend on the class. And for this, you have to use the lemmas we saw last time, which we said that uh, if you have a cofibrant source or a fibrant target and so on, then post composition uh, of left or right homotopic maps are left or right homotopic or pre composition. So using these uh, lemmas and the fact that we only look at cofibrant fibrant objects, you can check that this is well be this is well defined, and this is uh, associative and unital. All right. So is this clear uh, for everyone? This uh, what is hidden in here in this definition? So to check that it is a category, you have to check well that there exists some kind of composition, and that the composition is associative and unital. And to do this, you use the lemma. from last time. All right. So any questions before I go on? All right, so we start to get to the first important theorem, which is uh, the white head theorem. So it's not really the Whitehead theorem, of course, because the Whitehead theorem is about topological spaces, but this is a complete analog. So let f from a to x be a morphism between vibrant, cofibrant, objects, then the following statements are uh, equivalent. So the first one is that F is a weak equivalent. And the second statement is that there exists some G from X to A such that G circle F is homotopic to the identity of A and F circle G is homotopic to the identity of X, which is to say that F is some kind of, uh, F is a strong homotopy equivalent. Oh, Excusez-moi. Oui. En fait, je crois que j'ai raté un truc dans la définition de la catégorie euh, PAI, euh, euh, bah, la catégorie que vous venez de définir. Oui, oui, oui. Les objets, c des, c ils sont à la fois cofibrants et fibrants Oui, oui, oui. Ok, mais du coup, on perd un peu de l'information, alors qu'avant, on avait montré que quand on avait A fibrant et X cofibrant, mm -hmm. ça suffisait pour que euh, AX, bah, l'homme de AX, il y avait bien une relation avec l'homme. Oui. Yeah, so... Yeah, so here, so let me clarify, this means objects that are at the same time fibrant and cofibrant, right? Uh, so here in the previous lemma, uh, we saw that uh, this definition is well, like if the source is cofibrant and the target is fibrant, then the two relations are equivalent. This is true. But for example, here we are talking about a map in the reverse direction. So if we want to be able to For example, uh, write this, uh, we are looking at maps from A to A, right? And so we need A to be fibrant as well. Otherwise, uh, the relation is not well defined, like uh, left and right are not equivalent. And similarly here, the identity of X, we need also X to be cofibrant. Otherwise, uh, we don't, uh, we don't, uh, so how to say, uh, the, the two relations, left or right homotopic are not equivalent. But this is not an issue because if you recall, uh, we had uh, this property. The homotopy category of uh, CCF was, e uh, was equivalent to the homotopy category of Rho of C, 
OCF. All right. So if we look at the localization of O of C, we can restrict to fibrant cofibrant objects. It doesn't make a difference. Uh, so it's we don't really lose any information by uh, just looking at fibrant cofibrant object. What is going to be uh, we are going to see this uh, a little bit later. Uh, what, what we are going to need to do is for any object to find a fibrant cofibrant resolution also for X. So we have two resolutions and only then we can compute the handset. So we have to resolve at, at the same time the source and the target side of morphisms. This is something that we don't really see in topological spaces or chain complexes because in these cases, or even simply your sets. In these cases, uh, either all the objects are cofibrant or all the objects are fibrant. But there are some cases, some model categories in which uh, some objects are neither fibrant and cofibrant. And so we need to resolve both. Otherwise, uh, we have some issue. For example, here, even just to state this, uh, I need at the same time A and X to be fibrant and cofibrant. Otherwise, uh, there is some something uh, not working. Okay, is this uh, okay as an explanation? Yes. Oh. All right. So, uh, over questions before I go on. So this is probably one of the most important theorems of today, I guess. Uh, so don't hesitate to, like if there is something that's not clear uh, or that you don't really get, uh, just let me know <laughs> as soon as possible. Um, moi, j'ai une deuxième question. Oui. S'il vous plaît. Merci oui, d'ailleurs oui. pour la réponse. Uh, C'était uh, en fait, est-ce que, bah, um, does um, is the homotopy uh, condition um, in the sense of uh, model category, is it is the same when we consider the top category um, uh, equipped uh, with uh, is is model category, its model mm -hmm. category. Uh, is it the same the homotopy condition when uh, we think of topological space in uh, the normal way and in the model category way? So not not exactly uh, because. Uh, so I don't remember if I said it, but uh, for example, for uh, cylinder objects, uh, let me just write on the side here. For example, in, in top, uh, if you look at some space X, right? Uh, the natural candidate that we mm -hmm. use all the time is uh, A cross zero one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is always a uh, homotopy equivalence, not a problem. Uh, the thing is that this is not always a uh, cofibration, uh, right? You should see this as A cross zero one. Uh, I think actually we, this is a counter example we found uh, last year. If you take uh, A equals Q, uh, then this is not a cofibration. So now you have two, two possibilities. Either you take my definition where I uh, ask everything to like these maps to be cofibrations, which is uh, something I said is not an issue because you can always find a cylinder like this. But then you don't have uh, the same relation as in topological spaces, which is a bit, uh, uh, right? This is only true, for example, if A is cofibrant, then this will be a cofibration. So basically, if A is CW complex. But uh, or the other option is uh, to say, okay, for homotopy, I only ask to be to have any factorization like this where this is a weak equivalence. Then this is a, a cylinder and a homotopy is exactly a homotopy as defined uh, usually. Uh, the problem is that in several proofs, we need actually this to be a, a cofibration. So, but um, uh, when we in the definition of um, homotopy uh, in the model category, Mm -hmm. We say that there exists a cylinder, but uh, maybe a cylinder, uh, uh, in, in, even if we just restrict our attention on um, a uh, nice A, uh, yeah. such as a CW complex or something like that, mm -hmm. um, the cylinders, uh, it, it might happen that there is uh, A uh, cup A to P to A, 
uh, where yeah. p is really different from uh, a oh, right. uh, times z1 so yeah yeah, yeah but uh, so so what is true is that uh, uh, maybe i went a bit uh, i don't remember maybe it's later on in the note but basically what is true is that if you have uh, an object which is at the same time vibrant and co-vibrant, or maybe just co-vibrant, I don't remember. Uh, you can use the same cylinder for all homotopies. Like uh, if you want, we can uh, as add this as an exercise. Uh, exercise. If A is vibrant and co-vibrant, uh, we can use the same cylinder for all left homotopies. Uh, this is not very hard. You just need to use, a, for example, if you have a, a first cylinder, and even if you don't ask for this to be a, uh, like this, all right. And assume that you have some other cylinder uh, you can uh, like uh, do some tricks with lifting properties and end up with some homotopy like this that uh, makes everything commute, right? This is a small exercise. Okay. That you can, that you can cool. do. So for okay. CW complexes, uh, yes, the homotopy relation is really the same. For non CW complexes, either you can take it to be the same if you don't ask for this map to be a co vibration, uh, but then uh, in many proofs, you have to say, okay, I have a homotopy. I replace it by a homotopy in which I have a co-vibration and then I do my stuff. Or you can ask for all cylinders to have a co-vibration here, but then uh, the definition is not equivalent to the one of topological spaces. All right. Okay. All right, so any other questions about uh, the Whitehead theorem or? Homotopies in general. Uh, all right, so there is a question in the chat to prove a whitehead theorem or even the lemma with H star in top. We need compression lemma and the long exact sequence. Uh, well, uh, Sorry, what do you mean by the compression lemma? Okay, so maybe I, I will just answer this question a bit uh, vaguely. Let me just say that in topological spaces or chain complexes and so on, we have uh, like very concrete categories, right? So maybe sometimes we have some additional tools that we can use to actually prove statements uh, that don't rely on just uh, abstract categorical nonsense, right? Here, we don't have all that. We cannot, uh, like we, maybe sometimes we have uh, some ad hoc constructions that, that work for so our special cases. Here we are in a completely general setting. Like the model category can be uh, awful, right? Uh, very, very, like a very strange model category in which we have very few properties. Uh, and in these cases, we are only going to have uh, these tools at our disposal. Right. Uh, right. So. So the link between vibrant and co-vibrant objects uh, and CW complexes uh, was that CW complexes are co-vibrant objects in top in the equivalent structure. Uh, but of course, not all uh, co-vibrant objects are CW complexes. Uh, I gave a counter example last time or time before all that. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of, so the question in the chat is that, is it hidden in the proof that top is a model category? Uh, yes, there are a lot of things hidden that uh, in, the, in this proof. As I said, once you have a model categories, uh, doing computations inside it is not so hard. 
but it, it is not easy to, to prove that something is a model category. Uh, this is what we are going to do once we are done with this whitehead theorem is to prove that uh, chain complexes are model category and uh, we are going to see a theorem that you can use later to prove that uh, top is a model category. Uh, you are going to see that uh, it is not trivial at all. Uh, you have to you have to really uh, work to, to do this and to use. So this is the hard part. It's to use the, the actual properties of your category to prove that it is a model category. Once you have done that, you have access to all these abstract theoretical nonsense. But to prove the, the fact that it's a model category is something that is going to be a, a very, a very specific to every category. Yeah, so someone raise their hand. Oui, c'est désolé si je vais parler en français. Oui, Mais, euh, en fait, même entre le théorème de Whitehead qu'on énonce ici et celui en, dans les espaces topologiques, mm -hmm. il y a aussi le fait que dans les espaces topologiques, on parle des CW complexes. Et donc, mm -hmm. même si on arrive à prouver que top, c'est une catégorie de modèle, mm -hmm. il faut quand même... Euh, le, ce que disait Jonas, je pense, c'est le fait que euh, dans la preuve du théorème de Whitehead dans top, utiliser des, des lemmes très spécifiques au CW complexe, lemmes de compression, des choses comme ça. Oui. Et donc, euh, je pense que ces choses-là, on ne peut pas les éviter, mais il faut, ça, ça doit apparaître dans le fait que quand on essaie d'appliquer cette version générale du théorème à la catégorie top, alors il faut, il faut bien qu'on… Parce que dans, ici, l'hypothèse dit quand on prend des objets fibrants, cofibrants, oui. alors que l'énoncé dans top dit quand on prend des CW complexes. Donc, ça doit apparaître oui, dans… Oui, mais alors dans top, euh, tous les objets sont fibrants. Donc, ça, ce n'est pas une condition. Et euh, les objets cofibrants, bah notamment les CW complexes sont fibrants. Donc ce théorème implique le théorème de Whitehead standard. Mais, mais du coup, la, la, la preuve que les CW complexes sont fibrants doit faire. Euh, euh, sont cofibrants, euh, oui. Ah, C'est euh, là qu'on va devoir utiliser des résultats. C'est vrai que ça va être plus compliqué du coup. Euh, et ça, ça, en fait, on. On va le voir pas directement dans top, mais plutôt dans les complexes de chaîne parce que c'est plus simple, c'est linéaire et tout ça. Euh, et vous, enfin, mais on comprendra plus ou moins bien euh, comment ça se passe pour les espaces topologiques euh, juste dans la, la section suivante. Donc, euh, c est, c est, ça peut aussi être un avantage des catégories de modèles, c'est que ça sépare un peu en deux les, les problèmes. D'un côté, il y a mettre euh, dans la catégorie de modèle, dans, pardon, la catégorie qu'on a dans le. le Maybe I speak in English. So the first problem separates issues, right? You have uh, first, you put your category inside the framework of model categories, which uses maybe compression lemma and so on. And then you have uh, just this proof that is completely abstract and you have uh, extracted the, like the actual core content of the proof because you just are working in this abstract setting in which you don't have many tools at your disposal. All right, so maybe I, I go on with the proof, right? Uh, you are going to see it's not completely, it's, it's, very, it's quite different than the proof for topological spaces, right? Uh, so let me, uh, let me do it. So the proof, so this is an equivalence. I will first prove one side of the equivalence and then the other. So I will prove that, uh, so I will prove, sorry. I will prove this side, so that uh, so let uh, f from a to x be a weak equivalence, and we want to uh, factor it as uh, sorry, not factor it. Uh, we want to find a homotopy inverse to it, so something which is at the same time a left and a right homotopy inverse. Uh, so what we are going to do is to factor our uh, morphism as a cofibration followed by a fibration where both are acyclic uh, by two out of three because this one is uh, acyclic. Uh, it doesn't matter which one we choose. So factor F as A goes into, uh, so what was my notation? W goes into X. Uh, okay. And between, uh, so as before, we assume that both objects are vibrant and cofibrant. So let us factor A into X as a cofibration followed by fibration. Does it matter which one we choose as a weak equivalent because both are weak equivalences? So let's call this one I and then let's call this one P. Uh, 
uh, and we just need to uh, find homotopy right and left inverse for uh, sorry not p let's call it r sorry doesn't matter uh, for r and i uh, because as usual uh, if you have uh, two an inverse for this one and this one you just need to compose them in the reverse order and you get an inverse for uh, composition right and uh, notice that W is vibrant cofibrant, right? Because uh, the map from the initial object to A is a cofibration, and the composition here is a composition of vibration. So this is a cofibration. And similarly, here, X is vibrant. So therefore, the composition here is a vibration also. All right. So we can uh, apply uh, the theorem we just we saw before that uh, left and right homotopies are identical. So we just need to find some inverse of I up to left or right homotopy. It's up to us to choose. And similarly for R, right? It's up to us to choose. Okay, so let's start with R. So let us find an inverse of R up to homotopy. So of course, finding an inverse of I will be uh, dual. So I will not uh, write it down explicitly, but we are going to see that it's, uh, it's the same. Uh, so first of all, uh, why did we factor it like this? Well, now we have uh, some acyclic vibration, so we can use lifting lemmas and using these lifting lemmas, we are going to find some inverse up to uh, not up to homotopy, but like a strict inverse. So we have a, a diagram like this. Uh, right. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake. So it's a diagram like this. A goes into W and goes also into W using I. And then you go into the terminal object twice. All right, so this diagram obviously commutes. This is an acyclic cofibration. This is a vibration. So you can find some uh, uh, row here. Uh, so there exists row from W into. Uh -huh. uh, OK, sorry about that. Should be W here. All right, so there exists some uh, row from W into A such that, well, uh, row composed with I is the identity of A, right? So this is already a left inverse of I and it's a strict left inverse. It's not a, oui? Pourquoi la flèche de A vers W, c'est une fibration aussi? Pourquoi la flèche, eh ben, parce que... Ah, bon. Il y a un problème dans ce diagramme. Désolé. Euh... Ah, pardon. Euh, pardon. Flèche W par euh, enfin, A vers étoile, c'est... Euh... C'est une fibration enfin, française. Oui, oui, oui. Euh, et ce diagramme commute. Oui, oui, oui vous avez raison. Euh, OK. Ouais, très bien, super. Voilà, c'est ça que je voulais écrire. Euh, je me suis pris comme un pied. Euh, voilà. Voilà, parce que de toute manière, uh, sorry, so I just want some relationship with rho and i on the left. So I don't really care what happens here. Basically, I wanted to leave this, all right? I want to find a, a, a lift, uh, like a left inverse. And the usual choice is to put the terminal object here. And here it's a vibration because A is vibrant. All right, thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, there are questions in the chat. The air on the diagram, why, uh, which, oh, so okay, so this was about the previous version of the diagram, sorry. All 
All right, so there exists some, uh, some uh, left. Yes. Oh, well, yeah, okay, this is not, ah, this is a tilde, sorry. All right. Oh, our question, okay. So we have a row circle I is the identity and we want also to show that uh, row is a right inverse of I, okay? So we want to show that uh, I circle row is a is homotopic to the identity. So for this, we are going to use one of the lemmas we saw earlier. So it's a little trick, right? We want to show that I circle row is homotopic to the identity, which is to say that the homotopy class of I circle row is the same as the homotopy class of the identity. But what we proved at some point before, uh, it's still uh, on the board at the top, is that uh, precomposition by some weak equivalence is a, is a bijection if the source and the target are uh, fibrant and cofibrant, right? Or cofibrant. And uh, if the source is cofibrant. Uh, here, all our objects are cofibrant, so we don't really need to, to care about these conditions. They are, they are satisfied. And we can apply pre-composition with I here and pre-composition with I here. So pre-composition with I here, this becomes I circle rho circle I. And this is just because this is strictly equal to the identity. This is equal to the homotopy class of I, which is by definition the pre-composition of I with the identity. And using the fact that I star is a bijection on uh, harm mod homotopy implies that this is the same homotopy class as this, meaning that I circle rho is homotopic to the identity, right? So we have found something which is at, at the same time a left homotopy inverse, actually a strict inverse, and the right homotopy inverse of the identity. So similarly, you can find sigma such that uh, R circle sigma is equal to the identity and sigma circle R is homotopic to identity. And here I'm not precise about what, which kind of homotopy because it's the same, it's left or right, doesn't matter. So then, well, uh, in which direction? So rho circle sigma is a homotopy inverse of F because F circle rho circle sigma okay, is R circle I circle uh, rho circle sigma. This is homotopic to R circle sigma because this is homotopic to the identity. And because all our objects are fibrant and cofibrant, we can use the lemmas which state that pre or post composition is compatible with homotopy. And this is equal to the identity. And similarly, rho circle sigma circle F is equal to rho circle sigma circle R circle I, which is homotopic to rho circle I, which is equal to the identity. All right. So this is our map G, which is a strong homotopy inverse of F, all right? So this is the proof of the first part of Whitehead theorem. If F is a weak equivalent between cofibrant fibrant objects, then it has some inverse up to homotopy. So this is the, the strongest part of the theorem. All right, so any questions about uh, this proof? Uh, raté. Pourquoi I étoile est une bijection? Uh, so this was uh, this, this uh, property that we proved uh, last time. Ah, oui, 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 bien sûr. Okay, merci. Right. Excuse-moi. I is a, is a weak equivalence between cofibrant objects. 
and uh, the source of uh, all the objects are co-fibrant, does it matter, uh, all the morphisms. So we, we have a bijection, all right? So someone else raised their hand who had a question? No, okay. Uh, right. So this is the first part of the theorem. Now we have the second part, which is uh, actually not obvious, right? The fact that if something has a homotopy inverse, then it is a weak equivalence. For uh, topological spaces, for example, it is more or less obvious because if something has a strong homotopy inverse, you just uh, apply, the, for example, uh, the homotopy group uh, functors and uh, they are uh, compatible with the homotopy relation. And then it, it follows that uh, F will induce automatically an isomorphism on homotopy groups, right? Uh, similarly in chain complexes and so on. Uh, but here we don't have this kind of tools uh, at our disposal. So we need to make a proof which only deals with what we know, which is basically a vibrant or vibrant uh, objects and so on. So now let us prove uh, the converse, right? So let F go from A to X have a homotopy inverse D from uh, X to A, all right? So we have that uh, F circle J is homotopic to the identity, similarly G circle F. Uh, so I'm going to go on with the proof. So let uh, A go into W, go into X, be a factorization. So let's see if this is I, this is uh, P, All right? Uh, so we just need to prove that uh, this map here is a weak uh, equivalence, right? Because by two out of three, the composition will be uh, a weak equivalence. So we need P to be a weak equivalence. All right. So since we need, uh, okay, this is a fake question. So you have to, so to, to find this proof uh, is, uh, is not really an intuition behind it. You have to work with listing properties uh, several times to, to, to be able to find it. So a good exercise would be to try to do this proof again, uh, try to see what, what is needed about it and so on. So let uh, uh, A going to C going to A, B, a cylinder and take a homotopy H between uh, FG and the identity of A, right? And we are going to use uh, this identity, uh, this uh, homotopy in order to show that P is a weak equivalence. Actually, what our goal is to end up to prove that P is homotopic to something which is uh, a weak equivalence, right? And we are going to prove a lemma which says that if something is homotopic to a weak equivalence, then it is a weak equivalence itself, all right? All right, so using this homotopy, we want to check that P is homotopic to some, uh, to some weak equivalence. And basically, we are going to write that, uh, so let me give some, oops, sorry, give some kind of intuition. We have F, G is homotopic to the identity, and this is P, I, G is homotopic to the identity. And now this is a, uh, this is a, a weak equivalence between fibrant and cofibrant objects. So it has a strong homotopy inverse, right? Using what we just proved. And then we inverse it. And then we will apply, we'll prove a lemma which said that if something is a homotopic to a weak equivalent, then it is a weak equivalent itself, right? This is essentially the, the strategy for this proof. So let us uh, go on. All right. Uh, 
So you have to work a little to, to put everything in order, but let me do it and you can try to do it again at home. So we can find a lift H prime in the following diagram. So we go from X into C into X. Here we go into W and here we go into P and here we go into IG. So we use this factorization I, I wrote down earlier. Here this is uh, I zero and here this is H or metopy from before and H circle I zero is FG, right? And P circle IG is FG. So here we have vibration, right? Here we have a acyclic cofibration because X, oh sorry, uh, this should be, should be A definitely. Uh, because A is cofibrant. So here we have our lift H prime and let S be H prime circle I1 which is homotopic to uh, H prime circle I zero, which is by definition, well, simply uh, FG, uh, IG, so. All right, H prime is by definition a homotopy between IG, the composition with a zero and some map that I call S. All right. Uh, okay, so since I is a weak equivalent between vibrant cofibrant objects, it admits a homotopy inverse. Uh, using uh, the first part of the theorem that we just proved and that didn't use what we are trying to prove. Also, there is no logical uh, uh, loop, right? Uh, it's important. So it admits some homotopy inverse uh, R, right? And then P is homotopic to PIR, which is by definition equal to FR. All right, so what we have just proved is that, oh. uh, so I said uh, H goes in from C to A. Oh yeah, it goes into, uh, no, 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 it goes into, uh, yeah, here this is GH, all right. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so this is FG, and this should be uh, wait a minute. Uh, did I make a mistake? Uh, All right, so G goes from X into A. Uh, I think the only mistake here is that this is a GF. Goes from A to A. Uh, right, uh, and this is a GH. So GH circle I zero is equal to, uh, no, this, not good again. Uh, this is a FH, right? Zero circle G 
So. Uh, so i goes into w. Oh yeah, this, this cannot be ig. Uh, this is pi, and this is simply uh, gp. F. And F is not a vibration. All right, so I definitely want this to be P, I want this to be I. Si vous essayez X dans W en haut. Mmh. Okay, avec IG, ça, ça marche. Ah oui. Et de X dans C, c'est I0G. Oui, oui, oui. oui c'est euh, le bas du diagramme qui ne fait pas le changer. Mmh. Ok. Oui, et en fait, je me rends compte que c'est ce que j'avais écrit sur mes notes. C'est ce qui est dans le poli. Bon, je ne sais plus recopier. Euh... Désolé. Elle coule pas. Euh, bon, en tout cas, ce qui écrit ensuite euh, H prime, euh, so H prime circle I0, euh, H prime circle I0, still, uh, so this is I. Yeah, so I think now it should be okay. And then P is homotopic to PIR because uh, R is a homotopy inverse of I. And then this is equal to FR. And then we have the following uh, uh, lemma. Oops, sorry. Okay, there are some questions. H goes into A. Uh, okay, so this is uh, still a G here. All right, so let me now write the lemma. Uh, if uh, F is homotopic to G and F is a weak equivalence, then so is G. So of course, this is not the same F and G as before. Uh, this is just for the purposes of this lemma. And we are going to apply it actually to P and FR. All right. So let's assume that we have some uh, thing here. All right, then we have a commutative diagram like this. A goes into A cup A gets A x c all right this is a weak equivalence this is a sorry this is h uh, all right so this is f this is g okay so we assume that f is a weak equivalence we want to prove that g is uh, here we have this map which we saw was a weak equivalence by two out of three So, so therefore, H is a weak equivalence by two out of three. And therefore, using the, uh, the fact that G is the composition of these two maps implies that G is a weak equivalence. All right, so step one is this, and step two this one, all right? You apply two out of three to twice. So therefore, using the lemma, we prove that P is a weak equivalence. And now we have to uh, finish. Uh, 
because P is a retract of SP using the following uh, diagram. So C goes into C, goes into C. Now you go to P, X, W, X. Here this is uh, S, here this is P, this is SP and P. All right, so you can check that this diagram commutes and this is the identity. And SP is homotopic. So from before we saw that P is homotopic to FR. So SP is homotopic to S, F, R, and S itself is homotopic to IG, by definition of S of before. So this should have been IG, I think. This is IG, and then G, uh, GF is homotopic to the identity, so this is homotopic to IR. And IR was homotopic to the identity because R is some homotopy inverse of I, right? Uh, so someone says it has to be F. Yeah. This one? No, in the in the diagram, it's not GH, it's FH. No, above, above. Just above where you were writing. Yeah. No, below. The arrows from C to X. Oh, right. And yeah, H to I zero is identity. So mm. this diagram commute. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you see, it's, uh, it's a whole game of finding the right commutative diagram. Once we have done it, the rest of the proof goes smoothly, but trying to find out the right one. Even if you have it on your notes, somehow it becomes uh, tricky. Anyway, all right, so let me just go back over the end of the proof. So we had this map uh, S, which was homotopic to IG, all right? So SP is homotopic to IG and P is homotopic to FR. So you get IG, FR. GF, by definition, G is a left, left inverse of F. So this is homotopic to the NMC. And again, R is a right homotopy inverse of I, so this is homotopy to identity. So therefore, by the lemma, SP is a weak equivalence. And therefore, using the fact that, uh, so this was the axiom MC3, the fact that weak equivalences are closed under retracts implies that P is a weak equivalence. Which was, if you recall, what we wanted to prove at the beginning, because F was the composition of I, which is a weak equivalence, and P. Right. So I think this will be a good time for a break. Are there any questions before we have some five minute break? Um, Est-ce que vous pouvez juste remonter pour qu'on voit du coup les détails après? Enfin, moi, j'ai raté un peu, peu après le diagramme dire. qui pose problème. Ouais, c'est comme ça. Ouais, un peu plus haut, peut-être. Un peu haut, peut-être. Mais ouais, c'est bien. Ouais, parfait. Voilà. Merci. Bon, je vais. So I will pause the recording. Back. Uh, ok. All right. So we just proved the Whitehead theorem. So if you recall, uh, it means that uh, map is a homotopy equ weak equivalence if and only if it has a homotopy inverse. So this is already very nice. Uh, and essentially, it means that in this uh, category, pi CCF, sorry, in the homotopy category of CCF, you know, whenever we have maps in the wrong way, then we can find an actual inverse of it uh, and then put all the maps in the correct directions. And so we, it will be a motivation for the fact that this category CCF is actually the localization because the localization is this thing where you have uh, zigzags, but in this thing here, zigzags can all be put in the correct directions. And 
then uh, you just have to check that uh, two, two zigzags, sorry, two maps are connected by zigzags if and only if they are homotopic. So this is what we are going to do now. All right, so we get to the theorem, which is uh, in three parts. So the first point is that uh, O of CCF is equivalent to pi CCF. Uh, so let me also just write it as O of C. All right. Uh, the second point is that for all A, X in uh, C, um, in uh, O of C between A and X can be computed as a home between, uh, so actually I will write it this way. Sorry, I will write it this way. Home in C between QA and RX mod the homotopy relation, which is the same. So if you recall, this is a cofibrant resolution of A. This is a fibrant resolution of R, R X. So this uh, here you have a cofibrant source, a fibrant target. So the homotopy relation is uh, the same, and uh, it's this one. And finally, if and this is something I said at some point uh, when we define localization, if F is a morphism in C which becomes an ISO in O of C, then F is a weak equivalence. All right. We know from the definition of a localization that uh, the converse is true. If F is a weak equivalence, then it, is, uh, it becomes an isomorphism by definition. It is not true in general that uh, if something becomes an isomorphism into localization, then it was in the class of morphisms that we inverted from the start. Uh, there are some uh, trivial examples, uh, but uh, here it's true. If something becomes an isomorphism in the homotopy category, then it is itself a weak equivalence. All right, so we are going to prove uh, these uh, three things. All right, so we know, we are just going to uh, write down what I uh, explained, that O of C is equivalent to O of C, C, F. All right, so we just need to check that the quotient functor let us denote it by pi that goes from CCF to pi of CCF. So it's simply the functor that sends a, an object to itself and a, a morphism to its class in the homotopy classes of maps, which form the home sets in pi CCF, satisfies the axioms of the localization of CCF, which is CCF, where you invert weak equivalences, all right? So we are going to check the axioms. So first of all, uh, uh, it sends weak equivalences to Isot, this is the whitehead theorem. All right. And now let uh, F go from CCF to G be a functor such that uh, weak equivalences are sent, are sent to isomorphisms, all right? And we need to check that uh, this functor factors through the quotient. So we need to check that uh, there exists, uh, sorry, it's not this.
that there exists something like this, all right? Some uh, F bar. So we don't have much uh, choice for F bar. If F bar exists, it has to be defined as F on objects and as a quotient on uh, morphisms, right? Right, on objects you have to have F bar of A is F of A and F bar of a class of F is F of F on morphisms, all right? You have to have that because uh, this thing here is a, uh, well, surjective essentially uh, on everything. So all you need to do is to check that this that is uh, written here is well defined. This is not clear because uh, here it depends on the representative of the homotopy class, and that it is a functor. This is a, if it is well defined, it it, it will be a functor uh, for obvious reason. So we need to check that this is well defined. Uh, I e that if F is homotopic to G from A to X uh, in uh, CCF, then F of F is equal to F of G. Let go from F of A to F of X. So essentially what I'm saying is that we need to check that any functor from the category of cofibrant fibrant object that sends weak equivalences to isomorphisms must send uh, homotopic morphisms to equal morphisms, right? Is this okay for everyone? It's not completely obvious what I have written. Uh, if you think about it, it has to be this way essentially, but uh, you have to unpack the definitions a little to, to get to this point. All right. So here we are, we have some functor which sends from the category of fibrant cofibrant objects that sends weak equivalences to isomorphisms. And we need to check that homotopic morphisms are sent to equal morphisms. Fair enough. <clears throat> All right, so we need to check, we have two homotopic morphisms. So let, uh, let us take uh, some uh, homotopy here. Sorry. So we have uh, some the homotopy. between F and G. All right, and uh, therefore C is cofibrant, all right? Because A is cofibrant, therefore its coproduct with itself is cofibrant. We saw this, it's a push out of a cofibration, right? And therefore, uh, like a map from the initial object factors through here. So this is a composition of two vibration. Okay. And we saw that we can assume that C into A is a vibration. All right, this was part of a a proposition we did at some point uh, that we can replace any, uh, how to say, uh, if a source is cofibrant, then we can replace any cylinder by a cylinder in which the second map is a vibration, right? Uh, we saw this at some point. You just have to factor, if it's not a vibration, you just have to factor it 
like this and extend like this, all right? So without loss of generality, we can assume that this thing here is a vibration, all right? Therefore, C is vibrant because A is vibrant and the map to the terminal object is like this, all right? So C itself is co-vibrant and vibrant, is what I want to get to. All right, and this map, I will call it, uh, let me make sure that I don't write a mistake this time. So this map, let's just call it, call it J for some reason. All right, so since J is a weak equivalence, uh, it, uh, we know that F of J is an iso. Right, this is uh, the property of F that we assume at the beginning. And we are going to use the fact that F is an iso to have something uh, of the form F circle I zero equals F circle I one because F of J circle I zero is F of the identity of A. And this is because F is a functor of the identity of A, but this is F of J circle F of I zero. And this is an ISO. Therefore, F of I zero is equal to F of J minus one. But of course I chose to do it for I zero. I could have done it for I one. And therefore F of I one I zero is equal in the target category to f of i1, which was not obvious from the beginning, all right? Uh, maybe something I should have said, why can I talk about f of j, right? It's because I showed that c is cofibrant and fibrant. So it is in our category, right? It is in ccf because otherwise it is just in c and f doesn't know anything about morphisms of c. Right, it is defined only on CCF. All right, but now we have H circle I zero equals F, H circle I one equals G. Therefore, F of F is equal to F of H circle I zero, which because F is a functor goes like this. But as we just saw, this is equal to F of I one. Therefore, it's like this. Therefore, it is equal to f of g. All right. So what we have just proved is that if we have a functor which sends weak equivalences between fibrant cofibrant objects to isomorphisms, then uh, it sends homotopic maps to equal maps. All right. It's not. Uh, it's not something obvious. And therefore, using uh, what we explained at the beginning, it means that pi CTF is the localization of CTF with respect to weak equivalences. Le fait qu'on puisse choisir que la projection C dans euh, J dans de C dans A, elle soit, soit une fibration, oui. c'est dû au, à l'exercice que vous avez mentionné tout à l'heure, qui est que si F et G sont homotopes, elles sont homotopes par n'importe quel cylindre. Euh, on peut le voir comme ça, mais sinon, en fait, c'est quelque chose qu'on a fait la semaine dernière. Alors, je peux reprendre. Euh, on l'a fait. On l'a fait la semaine dernière. On l'a fait. On l'a fait. On l'a fait ici. En fait. Euh, ah oui, c'est vrai. On avait mon. You know, so it was the fact that we can replace a cylinder uh, by a cylinder in which we have a vibration, right? Uh, all you need to do is to factor it as a cofibration followed by a vibration. Then you get uh, something like this. And then using this lifting diagram, right? 
we can find some H prime, which, which goes from this new cylinder uh, to X. All right. So it's, there is no loss of generality. All you need to have is that X is vibrant. All right. But okay. it is, uh, it is uh, the case in our, uh, in our case. All right. So we have proved the first point of the, of the theorem. Localization of a C with respect to weak equivalences is uh, this quotient category. You take fibrant cofibrant objects and you take homotopy classes of mass. So this is not, uh, this is a very uh, powerful theorem because it tells you that uh, to compute uh, the set of maps of morphisms between two objects in the localization, which is uh, in principle something very complicated, defined in terms of zigzags and blah, blah, blah. You can only deal with uh, direct maps and just modeled by the homotopy relation. Right? So this is the first, uh, first statement. Second statement tells you that, uh, well, what do you do when your objects are not fibrant and cofibrant? Right. You start with random objects. How do you actually compute? Because this here only tells you what the home sets are between fibrant and cofibrant objects. So this uh, second statement tells you that you need to resolve your objects, but as is usual, you don't really need to resolve everything, right? You only need to take a cofibrant resolution of the source and a fibrant resolution of the target. You don't need to uh, take a fibrant cofibrant resolution of both the source and the target, as you would think from this uh, equivalence here. All right, so let us prove this. It's not so hard. So let us prove that um, uh, in Ho C of AX is um, C of QA RX mod homotopy relation. So you can think of it as uh, like, uh, for example, when you compute the X functor, right? Uh, you need to take, uh, for example, a projective resolution of uh, the source or an injective resolution of the target, uh, but you don't need to, to do both or you, you only need to deal with either the source of or the target, which is a uh, mirror of the fact that uh, cofibrant objects are uh, projective uh, complexes or fibrant objects are injective complexes depending on which model category you use, right? You can think of it this way, All right? But this is uh, easy. So by the first point home in Rho of C of AX, what was it? It was home in Rho of CCF between what? Well, we need to think back, back uh, about uh, the equivalence that was here, right? We had an inclusion in one direction that induced this equivalence. In the other direction, we applied the functor uh, fibrant cofibrant resolution. So QRA, QRX. All right, this functor, uh, the functor that sends uh, some A to QRA, was the inverse up to localization of the inclusion. All right, but using, uh, uh, well, first point really, this is how in pi CCF of QRA, QRX, which is this thing here. Oh, let us, let me write it uh, as a home set because it will be more convenient. like this, but of course, CCF is just a subcategory of C. It's a full uh, subcategory. So the morphism sets are the same and the relation is the same, right? So we just need to prove that this home set modulo this uh, homotopy relation is the same as this home set, all right? 
But now we have, uh, uh, so we use the lemma about uh, H star where, so H star being a bijection So where you have uh, this, uh, for example, you take the cofibrant resolution of uh, Ra. Uh, what am I seeing? Uh, this is not what I want to say, sorry. Uh, I want to say H lower star and I want to apply it to the other one. Sorry. So you had Q X. No, sorry. You have R X, and you take a cofibrant resolution of it. So this is your map H. So H is a weak. Uh, is even a, an acyclic vibration. So we can, and uh, the, everything is, uh, the source is cofibrant, right? So we can, uh, and the source also of the uh, homes we consider are cofibrant. So we can apply the lemmas we saw be the, the last, uh, last time, which says that H star from home of C of Q R A into R X mod homotopy relation into home Q R A Rx mod homotopy relation is a bijection. And similarly, same kind of argument, hum C of uh, Ra into uh, Rx, sorry, QA, and hum of QRA into Rx. You have a map which goes uh, this way. It is also a bijection, like right? it is a precomposition by some acyclic uh, cofibration, right? So in the end, this some set is uh, in bijection with this some set, the one that we said in the theorem, right? So this is a, a very typical example of an argument in modal categories. Like whenever you have uh, something, uh, for example, here. Uh, oh, I wrote twice the same thing. This would have been, uh, right, this would have been this. Yes. No, this would have been this, sorry. Like when you have a, a cofibrant source, in your home sets, whatever happens at the target when it is a weak equivalence, it doesn't uh, change the, the, it has a nice behavior, right? This is the content of these lemmas. This is uh, really the, the philosophy you should uh, take from all this. Right? Whenever you have a cofibrant source, you can do whatever you want at the target with a weak equivalence, basically. And if you have some maybe fibrant conditions at the target. And similarly, if you have a fibrant target, you can do whatever you want at the source between cofibrant objects. It doesn't matter. All right. Is it okay? Um, I have a small question. Yeah. Uh, do we agree that um, uh, QR is a composite of Q and R, or is it uh, more complicated? Yeah. No, no, it is, it is the composite of Q and R. Okay. Yeah. yeah Q, QR. Yeah, sorry, this is a, maybe a bit of, of notation. QRA is Q of R of A. It could, it could uh, I was scared that it would be a cofibrant fibrant resolution and it, that it would be a... Uh, no, because, but it doesn't really matter which uh, order you take. Uh, 
things because uh, if you first take a cofibrant, then a fibrant resolution, uh, you have a weak equivalence between the two, right? Uh, and uh, because they are fibrant cofibrant objects, uh, weak equivalences are strong equivalences, right? So what I'm trying to say, maybe I, I can write it on the, yeah, because it's actually a good question. Uh, why do I take R first and then Q? Why don't, why don't I do the, the opposite? Let's say I start from A. I have its cofibrant resolution here, which is a weak equivalence. And then I have, uh, okay, so I did the reverse here. I have its vibrant resolution. Or I can do the reverse. I can do RA and then I can take a cofibrant resolution of RA, right? So you have RQA and QRA. And this thing here is a morphism in the localization when you view it as some path category with a, a wrong way maps being weak equivalences. Right? But this thing here is a fibrant cofibrant. This thing here is fibrant cofibrant. So using the first part of the theorem, uh, this in the localization corresponds to a direct map in either direction. Right? They are isomorphic in the, in the homotopy category. Right? So it doesn't really matter which one you take first. You see what I mean? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Right, this, yeah, it's actually a good question. I should, maybe I should have said something uh, about it. Oh, maybe I can keep this, actually. All right, so let us go to the last part of the theorem, which is, if you recall, that Whenever a morphism is sent to an isomorphism in the homotopy category, then it was actually a weak equivalence from the start. All right. So assume that f from a to x is a morphism. Uh, sent to an iso in O of C, all right? So F itself is not necessarily a morphism between a fibrant, cofibrant objects. So if, he, if we view it O of C as pi CCF, where is F sent to? It is sent to QRF. All right, uh, what, what is the map inducing the last so there is a question in the chat, what is the map inducing the last bijection? Uh, it is uh, it's actually, uh, so you first have the vibrant resolution, which is a map from A to RA, right? And then you apply the functorial cofibrant replacement to it. But you have to, again, apply the lemma from before, which says that uh, uh, this is actually going to be similar to, uh, to what we have before. Uh, right after, you have QA, QRA. All right, here you have A, RA. And you have a map like this. Uh, no, like this, right? And the functorial replacement is some map like this, right? So it's a post composition by this map. And uh, therefore, it is probably in the other direction, right? So thanks for the question. All right, as you can see, I use uh, a lot of the time the fact that I have some functorial replacements, right? Uh, as I said, uh, all these proofs can be done without functorial replacements. It's just there's slightly more annoying, I guess. Uh, so I prefer to do it this way. Uh, as I said, all, all, all interesting, 
maybe I should not be so, 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 so how to say, peremptory. Uh, all the interesting examples that I know uh, satisfies functorial uh, replacement. Uh, and to my knowledge, uh, it is uh, completely standard today to define a model category as something that has functorial replacement. But uh, in the earlier literature, it was not, uh, not an axiom, but people realize, well, it's verified all the time and it simplifies a lot of the proofs, so why not add this axiom? But if you don't have this axiom, you can, uh, you can get away with it, right? Uh, if you want, you can go back and read the book of Quillen. Uh, he doesn't have this axiom and he manages to prove uh, this theorem. All right. So let us deal with uh, the last part of the theorem, which is that if F is a morphism sent to an isomorphism, then it is actually a weak equivalent. So where is F sent to, uh, in, into this category? So the image of F is uh, the homotopy class of QRF which goes from uh, QRA into QRX, right? So the assumption is that this is an ISO in pi C C F, right? So there exists, therefore, there exists some G be from QRX to QRA, such that the bracket of QRF composed with the bracket of G is equal to the class of the identity. And similarly, the class of G composed with the class of QRF is equal to the identity. All right, so there is a question in the chat. Isn't the map between QA Rx and QRA Rx in the other direction. Uh, okay, so I guess I was wrong when I reversed it. Uh, it's a post composition by uh, this map. So if you have any thing like this, oh, right, it is a source. So whenever you have a map from QRA, you can pre compose it. Yeah. Okay, so I should not have reversed it. Yeah, thanks. All right, so our assumption is that uh, there exists some G like this. So using the whitehead theorem, uh, so this means that QRF circle G is homotopic to the identity and G circle QRF is homotopic to the identity. So G is a homotopy inverse of QRF. And it is a QRF is something between a fibrant cofibrant object, right? QRA and QRX. So using the Whitehead theorem, QRF is a weak equivalence. All right, using the, the second part of the weighted theorem, one that is uh, almost obvious in topological spaces, but not so much in a, in a random uh, model category. All right, and now we have a commutative diagram like this. All right, so let me put like this. So you have a uh, it goes to X. You have first the fibrant resolution, Rx. And then you have a cofibrant resolution. So as I explained, uh, it is my, my decision to do it this, uh, this way around. I could take the first, co first the cofibrant and then the fibrant, and it wouldn't matter. And so what we have just proved is that this map is a weak equivalence. So therefore, 
this map is a weak equivalence. Therefore, by two out of three, right? You have a triangle here. So this is a, oops, should not have done that. So first step is that this map is a weak equivalence. Therefore, again, using two out of three, this map is a weak equivalence. We have a triangle here. So this is the second step. Third step is that this map is a weak equivalence. Again, triangle. Uh, so this map is the resolution, so it is a weak equivalence. And finally, fourth step, F is a weak equivalence. So you apply the two out of three uh, theorem uh, four times. Right, you apply it four times and you get to a fact that F is a weak equivalence. All right. So now we are done. We have a complete description of uh, the homotopy category, right? Which in principle, if you do not have a model category, it is something very uh, difficult, right? To, to compute. In a model category, this is the basically the, the whole point of the machinery is to have this description of a homotopy category, which is a workable. You have the fact that it is uh, equivalent to this category in which morphisms are just homotopy classes of maps. So maybe as a corollary. Uh, this is a set, right? Uh, because uh, in principle, uh, the home set between uh, A and X in an arbitrary uh, category with an arbitrary class of uh, weak equivalences, if you take the definition as uh, the path category bounded out by some uh, equivalence relation, it may not be a set, right? Because uh, if you look at uh, zigzags uh, like this, even just uh, two steps in the zigzag. Here you have any object, it can be anything. Like it can be any object which is weakly equivalent to A. And there can be a proper class of uh, objects like that, right? It's not necessarily a set. So if you care about set uh, theoretical issues, and uh, we are going to see that uh, precisely Monday, that uh, they are important sometimes. Uh, it, is, um, it is important to have this kind of uh, results, right? Uh, yes, yes, uh, we are assuming. Uh, so I think I said this uh, at some point. I, I assume that uh, all my categories are locally small, right? Uh, so the point here is uh, that if uh, the category C is locally small and uh, it is a model category, then the localization is also locally small, which is to say that the home set is, well, a set, not a, a class, uh, which is not obvious with the definition of a localization. All right, then you have this way of computing the home set, which is a very concrete way. I give you two objects. You know that to compute the home set between the two, you just need to take the, a covariant resolution of the source, a vibrant resolution of the target, and modeled by uh, homotopy. So for example, uh, if, I, if we are in the Quillen uh, structure, I give you two spaces and I ask, please compute the, hom the home set in the homotopy category. All you need to do is to find the CW approximation of the source. Compute all maps, well, compute all maps. Uh, you cannot really compute all maps, but uh, if we could, if we could do it even for spheres, uh, it would be <laughs> amazing. But uh, anyway, uh, it's still better than zigzag, uh, and then modeled by homotopy, right? And then you have this uh, extra property, which is just uh, like a cherry on top, uh, which is that if some morphism is sent to an ISO in the homotopy category, then it is a weak equivalence. 
which is basically a reformulation of uh, the Whitehead theorem. Uh, the Whitehead theorem, which is here. So this part of the Whitehead theorem, that uh, the second point implies the first, basically a reformulation of that. In, in topological spaces, of course, it's not an interesting statement, but in general, it is, uh, well, uh, sorry, I should not have said it like this. More, more precisely, it's not directly a reformulation, is that this uh, characterization of uh, isomorphism, in, this is a characterization of isomorphisms in the localization. Like, because this is uh, what we had at the beginning as a, like a goal. What are the strong homotopy equivalences? And between fibrant cofibrant objects, they are just weak equivalents. All right. So, any are there any questions about all this? Any uh, anything that is not clear or uh, any remarks? Connections with uh, what you know about topological spaces or chain complexes. Maybe I can give one example. Uh, right. So what we are going to, so there are just five minutes left, so I do not really have time. Uh, the goal for next time. And to be honest, I'm not sure we will be able to do it in two hours. So we will see. Uh, prove that CH greater than zero of R, so the category of non negatively graded chain complexes, has a projective model structure. Uh, okay, maybe it's not a great way of saying it, it has a model structure which is called the projective model structure, right? There is not uh, something, uh, a property of model structure called projective model structure. But it is the name of the model structure where uh, weak equivalences are isos. Uh, Co-fibrations. So, okay, maybe I start with fibrations. Uh, Surjections in a positive degree, right? And co-fibrations, so I mentioned it in the first lecture, if you take uh, unbounded chain complexes, it's uh, hard to describe co-fibrations, but for bounded ones, it's uh, easier. There are injections with a projective co-kernel, right? So here, uh, I mean that uh, it's uh, a chain map from C star to D star, such that I n is injective all n, and D n mod C n is projective as a as a R module, right? And so, once we have done all this. Like when we have proved that there is a model structure, and to prove this, we are going to use very specific uh, properties of uh, chain complexes, right? It's not uh, going to be uh, like actually, it is, there is going to be a general theorem that we are going to apply, but it, it deals with uh, properties of chain complexes that are very specific. But once we have done this as a corollary, if you take uh, the home set in the homotopy category of CIG of R of sigma M A sigma N B, where uh, this is uh, the chain complex zero everywhere except 
in position uh, M similarly here. This is going to be the X uh, to the degree N minus M R A B, right? Because uh, everything is going to be vibrant, so you don't need to resolve this. You take a co-fibrant resolution of this, you take homotopy classes and you modulate by homotopy. This is basically H zero of the uh, home complexes between the two. Uh, and you compare with the definition, this is exactly the X functor. All right, so I see there are some questions in the chat. Uh, shouldn't it be quasi ISO? Oh, right, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I forgot the, the Q. This is not, wiki frequencies are not isomorphisms, they are quasi isomorphisms. Right. Yeah, uh, as someone said in the chat, localizing with respect to isomorphisms is not, uh, yeah, it's not really interesting. Uh, it's true. Uh, yeah. Uh, Excusez-moi. Oui. Est-ce que uh, quand on prend la, la catégorie CH inférieur ou égal à zéro et mm -hmm. uh, la, avec la, la, la structure injective, oui. est-ce que le fait que c'est une catégorie de modèle Ouais. C'est euh, équivalent à ça. Enfin, Est-ce qu'on peut passer l'un à l'autre facilement par euh, exemple, Non. Pas vraiment. Euh, non. Non, non, c'est vraiment. Uh, so, maybe I said in English. So, there is also the injective model structure on CH greater or equal to zero of R. Uh, it is a, a very different uh, thing because. For this one, we are going to use a, a general framework which will be called a co fibrantly uh, Maybe I can write it. co fibrantly generated model categories. Uh, and I, uh, uh, so this is uh, off the top of my head. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, if I not say mistake, uh, so this category here with uh, injective model uh, structure is not, uh, uh, how to say, is not cofibrantly generated. I guess it will be uh, fibrantly generated, but uh, the problem with uh, fibrantly generated, there is, a, there is an asymmetry between uh, cofibrations and fibrations. Uh, I'm getting ahead of the last, next lecture, but uh, basically we are going to need uh, to deal with uh, objects which are uh, small in some sense. Uh, I'm going to explain uh, next time uh, what this means, uh, but maybe I, I can uh, say it very briefly now. Uh, we, 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 we are going to need to use objects which are small and objects which are small means uh, objects which uh, satisfy uh, the fact that colim of hum of uh, a x n is hum of a colim of x n. All right, for all. Uh, okay, so there is this notion of small objects, right? Uh, and we are going to use something called the small object argument. So you could think, okay, I'm going to uh, take the dual category, reverse everything. Uh, the problem is that then, instead of a small object, you have to deal with uh, co-small objects, right? And the problem is that there are uh, almost no co-small objects in uh, chain complexes, right? There is a, a real uh, asymmetry here uh, between uh, the left side and the right side, right? Uh, it's, it's a nice exercise if you want to think about it until Monday. Uh, otherwise, uh, try to. Uh, we are going to see this again uh, on Monday. Take uh, the category of sets, just sets and maps. Try to think about what are the small objects. We are going to see there are just the finite sets. And try to think about what are the co small sets. So the small object in the opposite category. And we are going to see there are not many of them. In fact, if I remember correctly, there are just two. I, I will let you find out which ones. Uh, but anyway, this is a uh, real problem here is that there is this uh, asymmetry, right? So these, uh, these two categories uh, are very different. 
you cannot really attack them with the same kind of uh, of uh, strategy, right? All right, so I guess that's the end. Are there so are there any questions before we we stop? Uh, I have another question. Yeah. Uh, so let me just answer the question in the chat. So here, yeah, this is definition for a, a is small if for all sequence like this, uh, and as you say, finitely presented modules are small. All right, so there was another question, sorry. Um, it's uh, unrelated, but it's in link with topology and other category. Yeah, so and can you say again? Um, it's uh, about topology and- uh, Yeah, yeah, sure, the, sure, go ahead. Um, at the start of the last period, uh -huh. um, we, we we said that uh, zero one was a, a, a big fetus. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, last uh, period with the uh, new valet. Ah, okay, yeah, um, sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought, uh, it was uh, strange to me because um, I I don't see why we we would force uh, the segment in all topological spaces because. Uh, sometimes uh, the real topology uh, may not fit. Uh, inside the political spaces. Uh, and well, um, no, I, I'm feeling kind of better with the uh, model category because uh, we may have multiple cylinder objects. Yeah. So there is no only one segment. Yeah. But uh, uh, I'm also a bit scared because uh, uh, we may be losing insight of uh, what are the cylinder objects. Uh, what do you think of that? Uh, I don't think you should be scared. I mean, it's a very uh, good idea to use your uh, your uh, topological intuition to to work with model categories because uh, this is how they were designed. They were designed as a way to of translating all that we know how to do with uh, homotopies in the topological categories uh, inside uh, over our categories like uh, well chain complexes. We also knew how to do it. Uh, because we had homological algebras, as I explained, everything is linear, so it's simpler. But we have other categories in which things are more complicated, and it is a, actually a good idea to, to use your intuition. Like, for example, the proof I did at some point uh, last time, uh, for example, this one, right? I, I really used uh, the topological intuition here. I, I said, okay, I have a cylinder, I cut it in two, I have uh, two cylinders, right? Or, Said the other way around, uh, cutting is not really well defined, but gluing two cylinders makes a cylinder. Uh, and then you, you see that uh, whatever your cylinder is, uh, here I proved it in an arbitrary model category with uh, arbitrary cylinders. Uh, so even if it's not necessarily a zero one. Uh, well, why is a zero one so ubiquitous in uh, topology? Is because basically of our definition of, uh, of, uh, of homotopy, right? The notion of homotopy itself uh, in topological category uh, uses a zero one. Uh, and uh, you could think, uh, okay, but here uh, in the definition of uh, the topological category and the model category, uh, the homotopy doesn't say that zero one is uh, central to the definition. But the fact is that uh, it kind of does because uh, the cylinder is defined in terms of, uh, well, first of all, this co-fibration. And the co-fibration is what is some map which has some lifting property with respect to what? With respect to homotopy, right? It has the homotopy extension property. And homotopies are defined with zero one. So zero one pops up again. And similarly, here you have a weak equivalence. Weak equivalents are defined as what? As maps that induce isos on homotopy groups. What is a homotopy group? It's something that goes from zero one to the n to x mod some uh, boundary condition. So zero one is here again. So in some sense, you could think, yeah, I'm using cylinders, not really zero one, but actually zero one is always uh, in the in the picture because uh, either in the definition of uh, cylinders, oh sorry, not cylinders, uh, co-fibration because homotopy extension property are about zero one or weak equivalences where zero one uh, has uh, again a central role, uh, it's still there, right? So, but this is kind of a, a feature of uh, the model structure. You could 
imagine that there are model structures that are based on over uh, intervals. Uh, I'm not really knowledgeable about that. Okay. I, I don't know if it helps, but. <laughs> oh, I, I, it was out of my head that uh, it, it was again defined about uh, with the segments, but where it's part, it parted. I'm not comfortable with uh, the fact that the segment is the uh, ubiquitous. It's because, uh, well, basically, it's uh, how we do algebraic topology, right? We we only we are interested in homotopy, and homotopy is defined using uh, a segment. Uh, there are. Uh, There are other uh, ways of doing uh, algebraic topology. For example, you can think, uh, okay, I don't like uh, reals, I like uh, rationals. And here, uh, the interval is not really well defined. So you could like think about uh, this kind of segment, right? I guess. Uh, but uh, then you run into topological problems like uh, this totally discontinuous and so on. Uh, I guess your question is really, what is algebraic topology? And I guess my answer would be, uh, it's about homotopies <laughs> that are defined uh, like using our uh, intuition of what uh, the time is. And the time is something continuous, uh, like uh, defined on the interval. Um, so I guess it also goes, it's really like, if you are not talking about a segment like zero one, uh, it's, it's a different kind of math. I guess this is my uh, my uh, my personal opinion, right? Uh, okay, I, I think a bit like that too. But um, some topological spaces are completely unintuitive. I mean, for for um, um, variety uh, manifolds, uh, yeah. I feel it's a, a good definition because manifolds are have a good structure. But for cofinite topology, I don't see what time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, these, these kind of pathological spaces in, uh, in algebraic topology, we don't really care about them because uh, like, for example, a uh, cofinite space, I guess, uh, from uh, is contractible, right? So from the uh, algebraic topological point of view, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not something that we really care about, I guess. I mean, it's re it really depends what, what you want to study, right? Uh, in uh, like everything I'm talking about today is mainly about trying to fit in a classical algebraic topology into a more general uh, categorical framework. If you want to do other kind of uh, like, uh, if you want to study more pathological spaces, but then again, pathological is like a loaded word, right? So it's, it's uh, like my opinion about the value of the space. Um, it, it would be like uh, more uh, like topology, not really algebraic topology. That would be my, uh, my, uh, my take on this. But again, <laughs> this is more of an opinion than a theorem. Right? Uh, right, so someone is saying in the chat, algebraic topology is interesting in CW complexes in the same way, differential geometry is interesting in differential manifolds. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Uh, general topology is more general, yes. More general. General, like, if you want to study like cofinite spaces, it's more like kind of like general topology. So you have to use uh, different kinds of, uh, uh, like, you know, there is this whole thing about uh, banner spaces and so on. Uh, and you study them using uh, functional analysis. But from an algebraic topological viewpoint, they are contractible. So, yeah. Right, so I guess we are uh, going into uh, like a whole discussion. So are there any questions about the course before I stop? Because this way people who want to, to stop can stop. I will stop the recording. And then if you want, we can talk about this a bit more. But uh, just not to force everyone to stay connected. So, all right, so no questions about uh, the last theorem we saw. So. so as I said, next time, goal, projective structure on chain complexes. 
as you are going to see, it's not so trivial. All right, so I will stop the recording. Uh,